What does it mean to fight spiritual battles as followers of Christ? Find out on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. I'm Dylan Burroughs together with co-host Joseph Kerr, and we're glad to join you today. Even as a Christian, it can be difficult to discern the facts about the supernatural nature of good and evil. How much has pop culture influenced our ideas about angels and demons? Why do we as Christians face spiritual warfare when the Holy Spirit dwells within us? What limits exist on Satan's powers? To join us, we have author Todd Hampson to talk about these and other questions based on his new book, The Nonprofit's Guide to Spiritual Warfare. Todd Hampson is a speaker, illustrator, animation producer, and the best-selling author of the Nonprofits Guide book series. His award-winning animation company, Timbuktoons, has produced content for many well-known ministry organizations. Todd and his wife are the proud parents of three grown children and make their home in Georgia. Todd, thanks for joining us today on A View from the Wall. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, we enjoy having you with us. You had some excellent books over the years, especially recently with this nonprofit series. And this new one on spiritual warfare is key for our listeners. We hear people talk about spiritual battles, but most of us have no idea what it means to be involved in spiritual warfare. Why do Christians need to understand what spiritual warfare is all about? Well, it's, you know, it's one of those complex topics that um, Christians are familiar with, but maybe they don't know some of the details out. And of course, different ideas from pop culture have kind of crept in. So, um, you know, I really wanted to unpack in an in a easy to understand systematic way to kind of show how we're really, we're kind of behind enemy lines right now, so to speak. This is Satan's world, so to speak, after the fall. Uh, we know that Jesus is coming one day to reclaim that and uh, that he, he's sovereign over all and he, he guides our steps while we're in the midst of it. But there's a lot of confusion about the topic. How do we fight and why do we fight? Why are we caught in the middle? Uh, where is this fight headed and when does it all end? So these are some of the questions that I try to answer in the book. Before we get too far into the topic, you use a unique presentation using the comic character, the nonprofit. Talk a little bit about how that idea came about and how you use him to get the message. Yeah, the nonprofit is, he's kind of a funny little character I came up with um, because all the books in the series are on complex somewhat scary or somewhat intimidating topic. So I I wanted some, some humor to kind of break those barriers down. And so he serves as a comedy relief. He's the nonprofit in the sense that he always gets prophecy wrong. So throughout the book series, he's, he's always the bad example and the, and kind of a comical example and uh, brings a little bit of humor and lightheartedness to some heavy topics. Well, one thing I definitely want us to take some time to talk about is what the Bible describes in Job chapter 1. This is one of those spiritual warfare passages that people are often confused about when they talk about the unseen realm. And for people unfamiliar with the passage in Job 1, uh, that chapter, Satan is allowed into God's presence. He describes uh, what is called a divine council meeting where he has permission to attack Job in, in certain ways. Talk a little bit about how that is possible, how that relates to spiritual warfare as we face it today. Yeah, that that scene really gives us a lot of insight into kind of how some ways that, that things work in the unseen realm. And, you know, some people have written that off as, oh, well, that's just um, myth or allegory. No, that's that's mm-hmm. God's word. It tells us exactly, just like the rest of God's word, tells us how it works. So God kind of set up the rules. You know, there's there's apparently kind of a almost a legal system, so to speak, uh, in the unseen realm, a, a way in which God works through his through his creation. And even though Satan and one third of the angels fell, apparently God still honored that system that he created. And we see here that, you know, Satan is allowed into the presence of this uh, divine council meeting. Um, And what's, what's interesting is that, you know, God could have just destroyed Satan on the spot, but through his sovereignty, he allowed him to continue and allowed him even to attack Job. So that gives us some insight too that nothing can really happen to a, a, the righteous, to a believer, if it has not been filtered through and approved, <laughs> so to speak, through the hand of God. Right. Well, sometimes that's confusing because we have this idea of a heavenly court or divine counsel 
things we don't talk about in church much is just triune God, and that's confusing enough. But then we have other spiritual beings like angels and demons, and then the people that they influence. Explain this divine counsel concept a little bit, if you would. Yeah, it's almost like, of course, God, like you said, he's perfectly content and self-sufficient in himself. He needs nothing, but he, through his love and his character, he involves his creation. And, and I, I, the way I explain it in the book is it's kind of like his cabinet. Um, he doesn't need advice, but he involves other beings in how to do things. And that's just kind of how he had this set up. And of course, in, in his sovereign way, we know that it all plays out in favor of God and in favor of believers in the end times. But this can be a bit of a confusing passage when we see, you know, Satan coming in into God's presence and not being destroyed. <laughs> right. So just break that down a little bit because there are different parts of that. When the Bible talks about spiritual beings, principalities, demons, angels, how many categories have we got there? Yeah. And, and then when we get to Ephesians chapter six, we see clearly that there's different hierarchy, so to speak, different levels of evil uh, that work in the unseen realm. So this divine counsel, so to speak, is obviously the, probably the highest rank of beings that are the, that are there before God's presence. Um, and that rank, it's almost like a, you think of it like a military thing where there's different ranks and different uh, structures. And even we, we see in the book of Job that even though Satan and the uh, one third of the angels fell, that rank structure is still respected. You know, it, it says in, in Jude that the, the archangel Michael didn't bring an accusation against Satan about the body of Moses, but he kind of left that up to God. In other words, he didn't break rank. So, and I think that that's one way in which uh, Satan thought he could leverage his rebellion and leverage other things that he's done against the Lord is because he knows that God respects the laws that he set up and the rank system that he set up. Um, so he, he thought he could kind of leverage that and use it against God to usurp God's throne and, and try to take his throne. Well, that's an interesting way to put it. I know that there's so much confusion about the different categories of angels and demons and how they operate and influence in our world today. And I know that our listeners have lots of questions about this. So stick with us. We're going to come right back in a moment to continue our powerful conversation with Todd Hampson here on A View from the Wall. From I Am a Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am a Watchman Minute. I'd like you to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and how difficult it must have been for her to tell her parents and Joseph that she was expecting. 2,000 years ago, a pregnant, unmarried teen in Israel could be cast out from her village, perhaps stoned to death. I'm sure her parents asked her, how did this happen? And though I don't know for sure, I imagine Satan whispered to Mary, just lie. Tell everyone you were assaulted by a Roman soldier. An assault was possible. It was actually a more probable scenario than claims of an immaculate conception. Mary, just a little lie and all your problems will go away. The temptation to lie can be great, but speaking truth honors God. And when we live to honor God, God will honor us. Be bold. Be faithful. Be a watchman. I am a watchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. Joe and I have been talking with best-selling author Todd Hampson about spiritual warfare in his new book, The Nonprofit's Guide to Spiritual Warfare, available now from Harvest House Publishers. I love this book, and it seems like many of us have more information about the spiritual world from films and books in our culture rather than the Bible itself. In fact, a recent survey even observed that only 2% of today's teenagers hold a biblical worldview. So we want to talk a little bit about this. So, and begin, Todd, would you share for a moment how has pop culture influenced the thinking of the average person about spiritual warfare? I think you hit it on the, on the head in, in that, you know, pop culture at large, even a lot of Christians kind of take their cues from media and, you right. know, whether it's a scary movie or or uh, you know, a movie about angels and demons, they, they kind of take their cues from that and unfortunately pick up some erroneous ideas. Um, and then on the other extreme, more recently, pop culture has been introducing Satan as a good character and demons as good characters. So that's yes. even, even more scary because that makes people 
to kind of let their guards down and start to dabble with things in the occult and not realize the danger that they're getting into. Um, and one, one big thing, there's several things I think that people uh, get wrong, but one big thing is, is some people think that God and Satan are equals, you know, and that they're in this epic uh, eternal battle. And that's not the case at all. God is, God is omniscient, omnipresent. Satan is not, you know, Satan is no match for God. He's a created being that God made. So they're not equals at all, but God, as we mentioned in the last segment, God allows Satan to stick around ultimately to serve God's purposes. That introduces an interesting question because I hear people use this phrase and, and they just repeat what they hear, but they talk about the devil tempted me or the, the devil brought this into my life or the, the, the devil did this or I'm battling the devil on this. The, <laughs> the devil is, at your point, one character. He is not omnipresent. He's not God, can't be everywhere. Is it likely that any of us have ever had spiritual battles with the devil himself? No, I highly doubt it, unless we're really doing some gigantic things for the kingdom. You know, uh, I could imagine that I've heard stories that like Martin Luther felt he had been uh, kind of harassed by Satan personally. I don't know if that's true, but, you know, what he did was big enough. Or, you know, you think of Billy Graham or somebody like that, someone who's reaching millions of people for the Lord. Um, but uh in that hierarchical system that we mentioned, that kind of tiered system that's set up like a military structure, and that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, Satan does have this kind of network of evil that reaches into pretty much every realm that you can think of. So he he's a master counterfeiter. You know, he, he tries to counterfeit what God does. He knows he can't be God's equal, but he's, he's trying to use this network system to mimic God's uh, ability to see everything and uh, mimic God's ability to, to be in more than pla one place at a time. But, uh, but no, you or I probably have never been harassed by Satan personally. Uh, he's, he's got bigger fish to fry, I bet. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's great. Well, if you know your cultural music, it, it's very likely that what happened is that the devil went down to Georgia, from what I heard. Isn't that the story there, Joe? <laughs> so he's not around where I live. He's down there closer to where you are. Um, yeah, so he's down in the south, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Todd and, I, Todd and I are in Georgia. I don't like the sound of that. Yeah, I don't like that either, man. We need to kick him out. <laughs> All right, well, you guys work on that. But on a more serious note, uh, even today, people struggle with this idea of whether they're really demons that influence our world, if people can be possessed by demons or influenced by demons, if demons can harm Christians. Talk a little bit about that for a moment, if you would, because that's really on the serious side, something that we do deal with. What do we talk about when it comes to the demonic as a Christian? Uh, how do we face that spiritual battle? That's a great question. And, and there's kind of two extremes I've seen. One, where people don't really realize, even Christians don't realize that uh, demons are active in our day, you know, because they don't see, you know, something spooky coming out of the closet. But I right. think in America, <laughs> where, uh, you know, Satan's able to use more subtle means to keep us from being effective for the Lord. He doesn't have to reveal himself, so to speak, or, or the demons don't have to reveal themselves. Um, but you guys, I'm sure I've talked to, to missionaries as I have on the mission field. I've had to, the opportunity to go on several short-term mission trips and have conversations with uh, missionaries who have seen that overt demonic activity uh, play out in real life. But most of us don't see it to that extreme. And then the other extreme I see, aside from people thinking that demons aren't active at all, is that there's a demon behind every bush, <laughs> you know, right. and, uh, you know, I, if I've got uh, a, a cold, I've got the, it's because of the demon of post nasal drip, you know, so they kind of blame <laughs> demons for everything. So I think it's uh, a good, you need to find the balance between those two and really look to scripture to inform, you know, how we know something is overtly demonic or not. Uh, and, and above all, just focusing on living for the Lord, rejecting evil and, and doing what God's called us to do. Most of the, or uh, actually all of the commands that God gives us are for our protection from that kind of stuff. So the more we live for the Lord and, and learn about him, the safer we are. We don't have to be overly um, enthralled or overly thinking about the things of the dark side. Is it possible, because again, we're talking to a wide audience here, so let's answer the question. Is it possible for people to unknowingly open themselves up to demonic activity in their life? I believe so. I think, um, as you mentioned, a, a lot of 
Christians these days don't hold a, a thoroughly biblical worldview, so they don't realize some of the things that are that have crept even into Christian circles. I mean, I've heard of Christians who check their horoscopes or, you know, dabble with like seances or Ouija boards. Actually, I think it's, uh, I want to say it's Hasbro, I believe, has a board game out for kids that's a Ouija board. So our culture no longer respects, um, you know, biblical tenets that kind of protected us from those things in the past. It's the, the more our culture and people drift away from God's truth, the more they can accidentally get entangled with some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think horoscopes, you know, some, some people do have done drugs or seances or messing with Ouija boards, all of that kind of stuff, palm reading. I think all of that can open you up to some demonic activity. Now, a believer can never be possessed by a demon because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So even an immature b- believer who maybe um, out of ignorance dabbled in, in some of this stuff cannot be possessed, but they can be harassed and they can have you know that influence in their life that affects their thinking and affects their choices. So um, to any believers out there who have dabbled in any of that stuff, um, my, my advice is just to reject it, to rebuke it, to, you know, in the name of Jesus, pray against it and, and never turn to that again and, and, and study scripture to know what things God says are dangerous and what things uh, we can safely, uh, in, you know, mess with without getting entangled with the occult stuff. Well, that's well said. And I think people more than ever need to realize that spiritual evil is real. It's something that exists and we have to be aware of and defend against. And that's what the spiritual battle is all about, this idea of spiritual warfare. And when we come back, we'll have one more segment with Todd. So stick with us here on A View From The Wall. We'll be right back. The Bible predicts the rapture of the church is coming. Are you ready? Soon many will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Only they will escape the dark days that are coming. A time of tribulation that will usher in the Antichrist and great destruction upon the entire earth. There's only one escape, one way, one light, one truth. His name is Jesus. He came and died so that we may live forever with Him. But to receive this new life, there are three things we must do. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Ask for forgiveness and receive His grace. B. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came, lived, died, rose again, and will come again. Believe that He is Lord and God. C. Commit to walk His path the path He wants you to walk, and walk it out by faith. Then you'll be ready for the return of the Lord. To learn more about the rapture and how to know for sure, visit amiraptureready.org. Welcome back to A View From The Wall. Joe and I have been talking with best-selling prophecy author Todd Hampson about spiritual warfare in his new book, The Nonprofit's Guide to Spiritual Warfare. His book is well-written and I highly recommend it, but I want to focus now on the book, the Bible, the greatest book of all and what it says about this topic. If we look, for example, at Ephesians 6, 12, the Apostle Paul addresses spiritual warfare and says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Talk a little bit about this, Todd. What does it mean to wrestle not against flesh and blood as a Christian? Yeah, I think key among key in that statement is the fact that, you know, we, we get mad at what we see. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll use the, the current political climate and the, the division in our country as an example. Yes. We see people with some crazy ideas and trying to divide the country and a lot of chaos going on and that kind of thing. And it's easy to look at them and get mad at them or to, or to wonder how they got so deceived in their thinking or, or things along that line. But when we realize there's actually something deeper and darker behind the scenes that's influencing that kind of thinking and that kind of action, that really these, these people are not our enemy. They need the Lord. They, they're deceived by the darkness, so to speak. And uh, we really need to pray for them. And remember that the real battle is in the unseen realm, and our real fight is with the, the evil forces behind the evil that we see playing out in our everyday uh, life. Um, the enemy is in the unseen realm. That's the main thing to remember. And, and if we remember that, that helps us, number one, 
remember where the battle is and also not grow, you know, any hatred towards any people. It helps us, you know, keep our eye on where the real battle is and helps us to know how to pray. Your nonprofit kind of stumbles with this a little bit. You have some fun with it in the book. Talk about the spiritual armor that Paul talked about. Yeah, he, um, yeah, I got a couple pictures in there with, uh, the nonprofit with some makeshift armor. That's pretty funny. And, uh, he, he gets it wrong every time. So there's a, there's a few comic scripts of him, uh, just totally messing up the idea of the spiritual armor. Um, but fortunately Paul does not do that. And Paul gives us some really good information in Ephesians six about the spiritual armor. And he's using the analogy from the, the, the armor that the Roman soldiers had in his day. And of course, Paul was very familiar with that, seeing them around. And also, you know, even being imprisoned and chained to Roman guards, he, he, he saw the armor firsthand and knew how it was used. But he talks about the, the belt of truth, the, the body armor or the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith the sword of the spirit. And, and ultimately he also mentions prayer that, that prayers kind of, you know, that's where the battle is fought and won, so to speak. Um, but the, the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon we have, but, uh, so we have to know scripture in order to use it. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Um, but interestingly, the armor starts with the belt of truth and that kind of holds everything together. The, the body armor fits into the belt of truth and the, the sword hangs from the body armor. Um, so the, the belt is really a key thing. So, so truth, God's truth is central to our protection as is being truthful. Um, and when you look at each piece of the armor and there's kind of a two part, uh, thing to it where part of it is what God has imputed to us, so to speak, like the belt of truth, it's God's truth, but also we need to take action to be truthful and people of integrity, uh, or the, you know, the helmet of salvation, you know, we, it protects our thinking, the, uh, the shoes of the gospel of peace, you know, it gives us stability knowing that we're saved, knowing that our, our position in Christ is secure, but also we need to take action and use those shoes, use our feet to take us to share the gospel. There's a way that when we take action, it actually protects us against the attacks of the enemy. Well, that's well said. And one area I want to address that Christians often have questions about is this idea of casting out demons. We've talked about demons already, but you you might flip to a Christian channel and you see somebody trying to cast demons out of this and that, and you wonder if that's something that God calls us to do today. Or on the other extreme, you think, oh, that's not a big deal. God took care of it all. We don't have to worry about it. I mean, what does the Bible really teach as far as Christians now? How do we deal with uh, demons in the demonic realm? Do we just pray about it? Is there a role where we you know, speak out against demons? What does that look like for Christians today? I do believe we can pray against evil in the name of Christ. Like I mentioned, some of those missionaries that are on the front line seeing some really overt, crazy demonic activity. Um, we, we as believers, we, we're not strong in ourselves, but we have the authority of Christ in us. So we can, uh, and we can't cast out demons or, or command demons to do stuff, but we can pray against evil in the name of Jesus. And I believe we can also, you know, there's a verse that actually says, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. So oh, really good. it boils down to kind of how the, the spiritual armor is explained and that as we just submit to God in those things and how to, how to use that armor, and then we take action to resist the devil, to resist temptation, to live the way God has called us to, I believe that sends the enemy running. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion around that where you see people, like you said, even on the TV, casting out demons uh, for people that they don't even know or just randomly. And that kind of confuses the issue greatly because it doesn't really line up with what scripture says. Todd, you've been on the program a couple times before. We really appreciate it. You know we have a large Watchman community out there. What should they know about spiritual warfare, and what should their message be to the world and the audience that God's given them? One thing I think that's key for, for Watchmen to know is that this is a topic that does tie directly into eschatology and, and 
to study the end times. And as we see the end time signs ramp up, one of the things we're seeing is um, just lawlessness ramp up. We're seeing uh, an increase in occult activity. We're seeing um, just chaos and upside down thinking and all these things that are influenced by spiritual warfare. And as we near the time of the rapture, I think that's going to ramp up even more because everything that we read about in the book of Revelation and Daniel about the seven year tribulation period, all those conditions are kind of forming before us today. So that I believe as soon as the church is removed, and by the way, I believe the rapture is a spiritual warfare event. I believe it's God, like a, like a special ops snatch and grab where God is sending in his troops, so to speak, to snatch out Christians before the time of wrath comes. And um, so he's snatching us out of enemy territory, and he's coming right into enemy territory. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and that's exactly where uh, we're told we'll meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds. So um, all that to say, yes, I think spiritual warfare connects directly with being a watchman, directly with studying eschatology and the events of the end times. Well, this is great material. And Todd, we thank you again for joining us. For those who would like to know more about your book or pick up a copy for themselves, where should they go to do that? Uh, They can go to my website, toddhampson.com, or visit any of their favorite online bookstores to get any of my books. Again, that's toddhampson.com. We've been talking about the Nonprofit's Guide to Spiritual Warfare from Harvest House Publishers, and we appreciate you joining us for today's program. We encourage you to listen again and enjoy all our programs at iamawatchman.com or wherever you stream your podcast. Thanks again, and join us next time on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.